All right, let's do some science. Ah. I'm just placing some glass slides here, something that you've all seen before, but now if you could watch what I'm watching, you'd be see tiny little lightnings. This is the only part of the talk that will actually have lightning. I'm going to move these little glass slides. All I've done is just cleaned it up, that's all. And I want you to pay close attention. Things will happen fast. Um, I'm going to take some water. This is just water. I added some food coloring to it to make it colored. And uh, we are going to place them on the surface here. Um, and if you can cut to the projection video. OK. Not that exciting. It just sits there. Uh, but wait a second. Watch carefully. If you look carefully, you'll notice they're talking to each other. They've just realized that something else was placed right next to it. This is just water. And they are signaling each other. They're actually computing which directions to go. And uh, now I'm going to just play with it a little bit. Uh, you know, why stop at green? Let's add some color to it, literally. And I'm sure you've all played with water and food coloring before. The ironic thing is, the phenomena that I just showed you had never been seen before. What you just realize, now they don't like each other. Wait a second. The green is trying to run away, and the red's trying to chase it. Like a little cop car, and they'll slow down and start something again. Uh, what's so fascinating about what I just showed you? In the end, it's something very simple. You might have seen it in your kitchen, although you didn't. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, uh, I find it fascinating. It's, it's such a simple thing. It's just water and some food coloring sitting in. And what we discovered in the system uh, is that these systems have the capacity to communicate, signal, and literally compute. Um, can you go to my first slide? So I could spend the next hour actually explaining it to you, what just happened right there. I spent four years trying to figure this out. This talk is not about that. I'm not going to tell you anything what you just saw, but I'm going to invite you to go home tonight, find a little Sharpie, some food coloring, some really clean glass. You can buy some pre-clean cover glass. Uh, put these things on and just watch them. And I'm going to share with you a very short clip of video of what did I do for the last four years. Uh, and just watch this. We can make them chase each other. They can climb hills. By the way, at the back of your head, you should be thinking, where is the energy source? You can have them line up like a soldier's. And you can literally turn them into a transfixed dance. What's inside these little things are tiny little tornadoes. They're extracting energy from evaporation to turn them into physical objects. This is actually not that far from how physical cells crawl around, like your neutrophils trying to chase bacteria. Blue doesn't, uh, orange doesn't like blue, so they can detect each other. So they know a sense of self. <laughs> and uh, you get the point. Uh, just go home and play tonight. 
But what I do want to mention today is there is a sense of wonder in some of these very obvious phenomena that lie right in front of us. If we could fundamentally understand some of these phenomena, you have the chance to actually exploit them. And that's what we did. And one of the factors that we'll talk about today is this idea that what you just saw, tiny little raindrops, these little bits of matter, that you can literally make machines out of these things. And if you're me, you think about what is the most ultimate machine that I'm going to make, which will end up being a universal Turing machine. Any of you who think about computation, this is the simplest possible machine that has the capacity to emulate any computer in the world, any classical computer. So it's not just fun and games here. If you think about the history of computation, all the way from the Jacquard looms to the Babbage machines, to every single electronic computer that you're holding in your pocket right now, they've all been about the idea of computation and about processing information. But laws of physics force you to think about that information has to be fundamentally physical. A piece of drawing on a chalkboard is physical. Electrons running around in your computer are physical. Photons are physical. And that introduces this new idea of a paradigm what if computation did not just process information, but could actually process matter itself? This is an idea that I've been obsessed with for the last 10, 15 years. There is a little bit of a history to it. In the old days, this is a relic from the space age when it got started, little rockets were being built. No computer in the world had the capacity to handle the gamma radiation and the temperatures of thousands of degrees to actually control the nozzles. And there were Russian rockets flying around, working with tiny little fluid computers that we were passing this material around to be able to control it. Uh, I don't know what happens uh, when something goes wrong in a computer like that. Uh, but it didn't scale. You're probably happy it didn't scale, otherwise you would be holding some wet laptops right now. But I started thinking about this more than 10 years ago. I spent a lot of time in my PhD, my friends tell me, playing with bubbles. And I did figure out a way to build a universal computation using purely fluids that scales at small scales, is uh, decently fast enough. But there was something lacking. It was completely asynchronous, and so some little bit of computation would happen here, a little bit there, they don't talk to each other. Very quickly, the whole thing would turn into chaos. So we went back to the drawing board again, and today I'm going to present to you a new platform that we are unleashing, which allows us to do synchronous universal logic purely using fluids. And I'm going to actually get into the technical details of how you can build it, and in the very end, I'm going to give you a tool that allows you to actually explore this. So let's get started. OK, you start with a little glass slide and you pattern tiny little magnets. These are soft magnets. What that happens, that gives you a little platform of a chip, and you put that inside some magnetic coils. You know, wind up some coils, you put them around, you turn the coils on in a way such that you can build a rotating magnetic field. One rotation of a clock is one clock. You apply a little bit of a bias field to it that allows you to actually magnetize the fluid droplet itself. Now you realize that you can make any shape you want. I just drew a T. You put that in a magnetic field, and it will actually magnetize. But then when the field changes, the magnetization orientation would change, and you end up with something like rolling hills. All remember the Microsoft desktop with rolling hills? Remember, when you put a ball at the top of a hill, it rolls down. That makes sense? In a system like this, you put a ball at the top of a hill, it would roll down. But the hills themselves are changing. And you end up in a cascade where the ball's trying to chase the hill at all times, and you get physical motion of this matter. Now, I have a better analogy than all this technical stuff, which is musical chairs. Here's a chair. That is the energy trap I'm talking about, and you are a little droplet, a little bit of matter. You just sit there. When the gong goes tick-tock, it's time to flip in a musical chair game, you switch to the next closest chair you find, 
and you move to the next chair, and you move to the next chair, and so forth. Now you can make it a little bit more interesting. What if I turn and arrange the chairs around to turn an infinite loop, and you'll actually be stuck in this loop forever? Every time a clock tings ting, you move to the next chair. This is a memory loop. This is a fundamental unit of memory where you can essentially store bits of matter and information at the same time. We actually built this. Here is an experiment that allows you to now think about this has been slowed down uh, 10x. And what you're allowed to see are these tiny little bits of matter running around. They don't need any instructions. I forgot to tell you, there are no wires. All there is is a rotating magnetic field. You can do something a little bit more exciting, which is turn into a marching army. These little things will just do their thing forever. You come back the next day, they're doing the same thing. Not that exciting. But I said, it is matter that we are manipulating. I could put anything in these tiny little things. I could put individual cells. I could put biomolecules. I could actually put patient samples inside these little things. And the way they organize and arrange based on what you run, they will find a place. And then magically, when I turn off the field, you'll see all of them freeze in place right there. And what you've done suddenly is you've manipulated matter in a very different way, where there is a state to the system. So let's complicate it a little bit. Imagine now I add a little more number of chairs, and now you get two choices of chairs. You go to the closest chair to you, and you move with the gong of a clock. You end up sitting on another chair. Nothing has changed. You're still stuck in an infinite loop, unless Another person arrives to play the game. Let's call red person Alice, another person Bob. Now Bob steals your chair. And now Alice has no choice but to find another chair, which is the closest next chair. And suddenly, the fate of Alice has changed. Bob's stuck in the infinite loop. Alice is out. What I just showed you is a fundamental unit of computation. It's called the AND gate. Only when Alice and Bob come together, there is actually an output. Now, when you start thinking about computation, you have to ask yourself, can I make a unit that allows me to make any computer in the world? We just did that. That allows us to make one single gate that can make any logic that you can imagine. Billions and billions of these logic gates are put together in your computers to do anything you want to do at a clock. And now, again, Alice comes along. Now, this is the actual geometry instead of the uh, fake musical chairs. When Alice and Bob come together, you notice they both change. And this gives rise to a universal XOR gate. And you know this is not theory. So you get to actually watch the video right there. Uh, both Alice and Bob are now stuck in an infinite loop. But this demonstrates the idea that you can do universal logic. Now. I said a Turing machine. Turing machine has something more fundamental, which is it requires memory. How do you build memory? So what you're looking at is the tiny little guy stuck there forever until a queue arrives. This is called a flip-flop. A standard flip-flop, when put together, turns into registers. Registers give you rise to memory. And we have all the basic units to build universal Turing machines purely using little water droplets. So at this point, uh, you start thinking about, wait a second, how, how big can you, how many little drops can you arrange? And I said, there are no wires. So literally, this entire setup shrinks down, and the physics works out that you can really shrink this down to a point where a little postage stamp chip has the capacity to control hundreds and thousands of little bits of matter. Now, you're sitting on your chairs like, I don't need another computer. And I don't think you do. <laughs> why, why would you do this? The fundamental aspect is the fact that every single diagnostic test, when you saw Ebola, when these little machines were being shipped out, you get the tiny little chips, but then you have a huge amount of infrastructure that goes in into controlling the chip, because the chip has actually no controls built in. So the cost of diagnostics, high throughput drug screening, actually single stem sequencing and genomics is based on all these giant robot factories that run and process these information. So there is an obvious application 
applying some of these fundamental principles to completely change how we actually design some of our chemical analysis factories. Literally, we have the capacity to make an object that is size of a USB stick that you would plug in in a USB drive and has the capacity to manipulate matter with thousands of little drug molecules and thousands of little cells and nothing else. But to me, there is something more fundamental, which is this idea that in our world, we're stuck with two ways of making things. There is the subtractive. You can take a chisel and chisel away matter, and you can build stuff. And the exciting and uh, 3D printer-based additive assembly, where you can assemble bits of matter. The capacity to process both information and physical matter simultaneously allows you to do something completely new, which is algorithmic manipulation of matter, which is literally what biology does to build a developmental plan is an algorithm. So instead of making an object, you would write a single equation, and it spits out a physical object. This is exactly the directions uh, we are at this point. But I want to be inclusive about this as a technology. So we put together all our papers, all the exact methods. We put it on a website. We put together a little tool, a design tool, that literally, if you work with Lego, you are ready to design. This website is live right now. All the people who actually upload and build circuits, you can make a circuit, upload it out here. We will be choosing circuits uh, on a bi-weekly basis and actually build and share this with the community. Because one of the goals is to get this technology out to the broadest group of people that now think very differently about computers. And I'm very excited to see what you would build. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're saying is, right now, when we output from a, a CPU or a computer of some kind, it's an electrical sy system that's translated back into bits. Bits go on computers or other devices, and then you, if you want to manipulate matter with those, then you have to use a 3D printer. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is you can not only compute, but you can manipulate matter, mm -hmm. therefore cutting out that interim process. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, literally, the output of this object is not just a string of information that somebody else has to act on. The output is physical matter itself. It's the organization of matter that you put together. So say uh, 20 years from now or 10 years from now, when you've got this um, going even more, maybe more out of the lab and stuff, can you give us just an example of uh -huh. like how someone yeah. at work or at home might yeah. use this to uh, Output matter. Uh -huh. So think of it this way. Think of your hand. Your hand is made out of, you know, maybe hundreds of billions of tiny little cells. This is the scale that we're operating at, that these little droplets that I'm talking about are the roughly the size scale of cells, for example, tens of microns. To build something like this with a serial process by putting one voxel at a time would take infinity. It would take a very long time. But if you think about rules of the game, you realize a finger or a hand this finger is literally a copy of this. So you've taken code, and you've literally copied it. I could have a finger and a hand with 10 fingers, just copy, paste that iterative code. And that's exactly the point, is the fact that we might have the possibility to build physical matter that's algorithmic. For example, you might want to make a fractal structure. But literally, when you compute that fractal, it's not just a graphic piece. It's literally physical bits of entities put together. Right, so something you could actually you could hold sit in your on, hand. give to your child to play with, or something like that. Yeah. So th this is pretty cutting edge stuff, right? I mean, it's not, that many, <laughs> not that many people doing uh, outputting matter from computers. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, every time you come on our stage, every time you come on our stage, you just blow our minds. Let me ask you one other quick question yes. um, about your uh, a project you showed at Tech Global a few years back called Foldscope. Um, could you tell people what it is in about 30 seconds, but also like, what has been the impact of getting Foldscopes out in the world? Uh, so Foldscope is a microscope. It's an origami microscope you put together. You do microscopy, but the goal is to do it anywhere. Uh, we wrote a paper, and then we moved on to other stuff, and we realized nothing changed in the world. Actually, you, know, you realize when you write a paper, nothing changes. <laughs> 
you have to do something. Uh, we decided <laughs> to. <laughs> we decided to build a little manufacturing factory inside the lab. Uh, we built the first 50,000 units, and we asked anybody who wants them, we would send them out. After. Uh, blood and sweat, a lot of work. We shipped out these 50,000 units that are around the world now into 130 countries. And kids around the world, including adults and everybody, are playing and doing microscopy out in the field. And the goal is fundamentally change a scientific society where curiosity is really what the starting point is, where you don't just wait for a tool or complain that I don't have this fancy tool, so I can't do this but to share the tool up front, and then this community has the same sets of tools. So we have farmers in Mongolia who are trying to test camel milk, and uh, kids in Nigeria who are actually detecting fake drugs. Uh, yeah, it's uh, quite crazy. So this, uh, it's interesting that you, you uh, distribute it in a two-pack. So yes. you're encouraging social interaction around science. Uh -huh. And they're about 50 cents each, roughly. That's correct. It costs us 50 cents to make. The goal is when you get one, uh, and some of you can get one, uh, you have to give it to somebody else that you think will never, ever, ever see through a microscope. And that sort of allows for this idea of science activism, where it's not just about you, it's what you do with that as a tool. That, um, yeah. It, it, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this microscope is sensitive enough to uh, see uh, uh, malaria. Is that right? That's correct. We've done tests for malaria. Uh, we have field studies uh, for schistosomiasis, uh, African sleeping sickness. And one of the contexts that ends up happening is we split up the project into two themes. Although it's sensitive to see malaria, it takes a lot more to do malaria diagnostics, right. which is training and everything. So the stream is not to wait. Uh, there is a medical part of this project. There is the education part. Anybody and everybody can have and start playing and deploying and getting trained. Because one of the challenges in healthcare is not technology, frankly. The, te the challenge is human capital. When a taxi driver starts driving a taxi in Uganda, why should he choose to fight malaria? And that's kind of the challenge we're facing, is combining healthcare and science education together. It's amazing how much you and Jose uh, are yeah, of absolutely. similar minds. Yeah. And Jose, you want to get a drink tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Manu Prakash. <laughs>